Okay, everyone. Um, so hi, everyone. Thanks for coming back after lunch. Um, so just welcome everyone to the last session before the closeout of Skylight's Public Service Design Conference. Um, it's been really exciting to listen to all the discussions today and the really wonderful um, insights from all the experts that have um, shared their perspectives today. So I'm really grateful to be in community with you all um, and just really glad to be spending um, Friday whether it's your morning, afternoon, evening, somewhere in the universe. So thank you and thank you Skylight for creating this space for us to gather. Um, today's workshop has an optional light activity, so optional. So if that's not your thing in this moment and you know, don't hit the leave button um, yet. So if you prefer to just kick back, listen, observe, please go ahead. Um, no one's going to put you on the spot today and there will be no breakout room. So, you know, grab a snack, an afternoon caffeine kick, a stretch, lay down if you want, fold your laundry, do what you have to do to be comfortable. Um, for those of you who um, may be viewing the um, accessible slide deck, um, I did want to, I did want to just note that I tweaked um, some of the slides in the middle, um, but hopefully it's nothing too disruptive and I can always upload um, a new version of that slide deck later on after the conference. Um, so as we get settled in, um, please feel free to, if you haven't already, say hello in the chat. And I know that we started talking about really cool books um, during some of the other, like the panel discussion and everything. So if you do feel inspired, I'd love for you to also sort of take a moment and share a book recommendation um, or maybe even an online article that you're into. Um, it can be a book, um, you know, about service design. It could be something else that you're just like really interested in or a topic area that maybe people have been talking about today. So one why don't you go ahead and do that and I'll share a couple things um, that I just kind of pulled out from my library. This one was definitely mentioned today a few times um, by Rihanna in the chat and Abigail, the Beyond Sticky Notes by K.A. McCurcher. Um, this one definitely is super awesome, really easy to read and goes into um, what co-design is. Um, I know we're talking a lot about child welfare, so I actually pulled this book, which I love that um, the Administration for Children's Services team here actually in New York City um, did like a, a book club around this too, but it's called To the End of June um, by Chris Beam. And this is an incredible book about the child welfare um, and adoption system. And it's, it's, a, it's a tearjerker. Um, Black, and, Black Experience in Design book just came out. So if you wanna get some really amazing perspectives um, on the Black Experience in Design, that one, Emergent Strategy uh, by Adrian Marie Brown, definitely recommend this one um, in a time like this. And then a couple more books and we'll jump into it. But um, this one just came out by a practitioner, Dory Tunstall called Decolonizing Design. Um, that I'm just getting really into to really think about, you know, our design practice here. Lou Down, the former um, UK, um, actually I don't remember their position, but incredible person who stood up, um, you know, service designers all across the UK. There's like more than I think six to 800 service designers in the UK now, but wrote this amazing book called Good Services, it's also beautifully designed. And I think they also now have a school in the UK with their partner, Sid Harrell's Civic Technologist Practice Guide. This one's super quick to read, but also um, it was really a really great perspective on uh, civic technology and design. And then lastly, this one I have a little bit in here too, but Hannah Schenk and Tara Dawson uh, McGinnis put together the power to the public. This one came out, I think about a year or so ago, but this one also has incredible case studies about how design and data and just innovation um, has really fueled the improvements in uh, government services. So lots of books that I have here, probably a lot more, but um, you know, just wanted to share those to like, you know, spread some knowledge this morning or this afternoon. Um, so yeah, there we go. I will move into today's agenda. So our goals for today are to build an understanding of stakeholder mapping and analysis. Um, and if you want to participate in a light activity to get your feet wet around stakeholder mapping um, and learn techniques that will help us better consider who should be at the table. Um, and if you would like to participate in the activity portion, please take this moment now and you know, read that green part here on the slide 
to grab a few sheets of just blank paper, um, you know, pen and paper, if you want post-its, Sharpies, um, or if you want to pull up a digital doc, you know, Word doc or some note doc, you can do that as well. Um, I also want to drop in just some simple, super simple templates. Um, I'll drop those into the chat. Um, if you want to work in a template, I made some simple templates in a Google slide that you can kind of copy and paste and work in. So the first two um, slides in that uh, template uh, link um, are things that you can work in for the prompt that I'm about to give you. Um, there'll be some Q&A and reflection moments towards the end of the session today, but feel free to drop in questions and reflections in the chat anytime and I'll try to address them where I can or later towards the end. Um, Cheryl also just feel free to interject me anytime if you see a question pop up in the chat and I should be, you know, I can answer it then or, you know, towards the end. And also for all the presenters today uh, that are here, um, I'd like to just kind of put on high alert too if uh, there's probably going to be some really interesting questions coming out from today and I am not the only practitioner in the room so I would love to invite you all to join me in the Q&A reflection session so if you have any thoughts or feedback that may arrive I'd love your perspective um, so we can really kind of wrap up today's conference and community with each other. So as you're kind of getting your pen paper and all that kind of stuff set up or you know some tea or whatever to get you going. Um, I'll share quickly a little bit about my background. So I've been um, a design practitioner for over 18 years or so um, and have been doing both public, non-governmental and private sector work. Um, designers wear a lot of hats, as you can probably tell from the presentations today, which is one of the reasons um, there's such a value add in any organization and especially in the public sector. Um, but in a nutshell, professionally, I'm from for the most part a visual designer, service designer, system strategist, and educator sort of mashed up together. Um, I served proudly at the design, as the design director for the New York City Mayor's Office for Economic Opportunities Service Design Studio, really long title there, um, for about five years, uh, leading one of the first municipal service design studios in the nation. So really super proud to have held that role. Um, and prior to that, I was responsible for building one of the first design teams at UNICEF's Office of Innovation in New York headquarters. Um, I'm an advocate of participatory and community-centered design approaches. And like Victor's and, and Victor and other people mentioned in the chat earlier today, I also truly believe that taking a design with and design by approach rather than a design for approach is essential for any service program or product success. Okay. Warm up. Um, so we be before we get into the lecture part, which is going to be probably the main kind of use of our time today. Let's first begin with a warm up activity. It's really simple. So um, and we'll revisit it again at the end of today's session. Um, you can participate in this prompt here, or I'll give you a fake prompt in a section in a second if you want to. Um, if you don't have a project that you'd like to work on today, and I'll give you a little bit of head down time um, with some music to let you reflect and write too. Um, so for those participating in the activity, um, hopefully I've given you enough time to get some paper and all that. Um, but okay, so what I what I want you to do is take a minute to just think about a project that you're working on. Uh, write that down if you want to, or just kind of note it in your head. Um, and if you'd like to share the project that you're working on in the chat, go for it. Might be great for just connecting with others who might be, you know, doing similar work or working in similar topic or policy areas. Um, so, you know, feel free to share that. I always love to see what people are working on. Um, and also, I just want you to know that today when I use the word project, um, consider this a word that's sort of interchangeable between product, program, service. Um, I'll kind of be toggling through those words throughout the session today. Um, so what I want to invite you to do is start jotting down now, after you've been thinking about this project that you have in mind, is to just jot down the stakeholders who are involved in your project um, or about to be involved in your project if you're just getting started or jot down people who you think should be part of the project too. Um, you can just list them down on the sheet of paper. If you have post-its and you're like, you've done this before, you can just start slapping things around however you 
feel comfortable. You're going to be messy with this at this moment. Um, I'm not really trying to give you structure right now here on purpose because the lecture will start to give you some frameworks um, and methods for thinking about how to structure some of the, the things you're writing down now. Um, as you're doing this, you know, consider the team members, the project partners, the different communities, even subject matter experts or other decision makers or influencers um, that are surrounding this project. Um, and where you can, you know, try to be specific with like names, roles and things like that too. Um, and for the folks that don't have a project that they'd like to share, um, I put together a little fake scenario here. Um, does anyone know what these photos are of? Any jerk reactions or feelings when you look at these? You can drop them in the chat if you want. Yep, it is the Department of Motor Vehicles or, or the DMV. Yes, sad cat face for sure. Um, so while the DMV, like many other government services, is making improvements for sure, um, I myself have had some smooth, especially, you know, especially digital experiences in the last few years. Uh, many people are aware that the DMV has historically not been the funnest place um, to receive services. So does anyone know what this um, animated GIF is from? Yep, Zootopia. It's the Zootopia DMV or the Department of Mammal uh, Vehicles. Um, the sloth here on the right, uh, Flash Slothmore to be more specific, great name here, <laughs> um, represents in a lot of ways how the public kind of generally views the DMV. Um, and the feline on the left kind of summarizes perhaps some of our feelings interacting with the DMV and perhaps our feelings about some government services overall. Um, so, okay, so for those who want to kind of work on this DMV scenario, here's just a super high level scenario. So based on all that stuff I just shared with you, how might we increase customer wait times for in-person services at New York City-based DMV locations? So I want you to think that that is sort of the prompt that you've been given for your project. Um, and so uh, what I want you to do is just kind of go heads down and again, jot down all the sort of stakeholders you think should be involved in really answering this question. Um, if you have any kind of questions about this, prompt or the project you're working on, feel free to go off mute or, or drop some questions in the chat. But what I'm going to do is give you about just, you know, 10 minutes or so um, to just do this kind of brainstorm right now. Um, and I'm going to put on a little music um, and then I'll call you all back in about 10 minutes. Sound good, everyone? Okay, folks, can you hear me? I don't do too much music Zoom DJing, so I'm, I gotta, you know, I'm working on it. So thanks for letting me practice today. <laughs> all right, all right. Um, how did that feel for folks? All right, was that were you like? I don't know. I'm 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 sitting here twiddling my thumbs. I can't think of anybody anymore. Or did you need more time? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yep. Yep. Um, so with the DMV example, um, you know, for, I, I just kind of threw some quick examples here of like people you might want to consider for this. How might we? So, you know, DMV department heads, definitely, you know, on location customer service providers um, and facility staff. We want to think about folks who are, who are around observing um, clients, you know, in a different way doesn't always have to be the folks at the front desk. Um, it could also be the security safety officers. Um, definitely the New York City residents who are using these services and coming into these offices, right? Um, I also just kind of jotted down quickly, perhaps like financial officers or legal teams may need to be involved because if you are making any of these kind of changes um, and the technologists, right? They're gonna all have to be in the know here that this is all happening. So these are just some to start off with, but uh, later on, I'll kind of show you how I try to complexify it a little bit more, add a little bit more detail to this. Um, so um, yeah, but for anyone else, uh, were there any other thoughts, initial thoughts or questions that you have so far uh, about your projects or anything like that? Legal's a good call. 
Yep. Yeah. You got to, I, I reach out to, I've learned to reach out to legal early on these days to get them, to get them involved and bought in. Cause usually there's more contracting and all that kind of stuff involved. <laughs> yep. Cheryl. Okay. Everyone. So you can pause there. You can put that down for now. Um, I am going to go into uh, presentation lecture mode kind of thing now for the next, I don't know how long I've, I've been time, but maybe 20 minutes or so. Um, so I'm going to go over, you know, this whole basics of stakeholder mapping here. So um, as you listen today, um, if there's anything you learn that inspires you to refine your initial exercises along the way, feel free to just kind of scribble those edits down, write down more questions, all that kind of stuff. And then uh, we'll go through that today. Um, so Let's jump into it. So what is stakeholder mapping, first of all? Um, I love to do definition breakdown. So first, let's just define stakeholders, right? Stakeholders are individuals or groups who are involved or affected by the development, design, and or outcome of a project. Um, stakeholder mapping is the activity of visually articulating an analysis of the individuals or groups involved in a project. Um, when we do stakeholder mapping, we first want to brainstorm everyone. We can think of um, just kind of like how you're doing of who's who, you know, of who's touching our projects, right? You can start this by doing something as simple as gathering with your teammates and writing down everyone you can think of, or you can grab existing map templates like the couple ones I shared. You can you can Google them even. I'll, I'll share some in a resource document later to help give you some structure to also work within. Um, and while doing this brainstorming, you're already lightly analyzing your stakeholders kind of based on things like who you know, how much influence you think they all have on the project, stuff like that. Um, and mapping really allows you to interpret your stakeholder analysis visually in a digestible way. And I'll go into why mapping is important shortly. Um, so once you're able to do the analysis and mapping, Project managers and others can take those assets and then develop the supportive processes to manage your stakeholders so that you can, your team can build, engage with, and take care of your stakeholder relationships. And the reason why there's this like analyzing mapping loop going on here in this diagram is because it's important really to consider revisiting your analyses and maps periodically during the project in case stakeholders change or shift um, with regards to their level of influence and power, for example. And I'll talk a little bit more about that um, deeply uh, in a second. So why do stakeholder mapping at all? All right, so as people who work or used to work like me or who will work in public sector, um, I know there's a lot of aspiring folks here um, today too. Uh, it's really important for us to take a moment to understand the traditional structures we've been operating in for centuries. Um, so on the left, we have this triangle diagram that articulates a top-down model where decision-making trickles down to the community. Most of the power is held often by those at the top, um, often by people who are furthest away from the realities faced by the communities that are receiving these services and supports. Um, and when we think of top-down structures, they are usually structures where people are risk averse and try to avoid making mistakes, um, where there's sort of a only one way kind of attitude. Um, it's not rooted in care, meaning it's not structured in a way that truly allows for communities to input their needs and perspectives. And it's often focused on quantity. Um, so the sort of more is better approach, you know, we wanna, how many people did we affect with this new service or program, you know, versus like the quality and satisfaction and sustainability of that thing. And overall kind of like not flexible. Um, so, Unlike a top-down structure on the right side here is a service design process. And so a service design process really essentially allows us to take chances and risks. It doesn't ask you to be a perfectionist. Um, rather, it's a process that allows for trial and error so we can learn from our mistakes and failures and make something better and make something that's sustainable. Um, it focuses on quality and community satisfaction and centers and involves community throughout the process. And it leverages imagination, experimentation and tinkering. You know, designers are creative, so we want that to be instilled in the work that we do. Um, and it's a process that values people's experiences and stories and rooted um, in care. 
Um, because of this sort of more of a more like a human centered design approach, it's crucial we take the time to map out all the individual and um, individuals and organizations who touch our projects. Um, so there are many important reasons to do stakeholder mapping and analysis, and here are some of them. Um, so as I talk through these, feel free to drop in other benefits too. Um, there are many awesome practitioners here listening on this call today, so I'd love to hear from you too. Um, so stakeholder mapping and analysis, um, it can allow you to better assess the scope of your project early on in the process. Um, it helps us better basically determine costs, capacity, resources, and time that we need to put into the work. Um, it gives us a quick and comprehensive view of who is involved in our project. So it's an efficiency tool, providing a visual snapshot of the breadth of the relationships that we should be holding over the duration of the project and also probably beyond. Um, helps us better assess stakeholders who might be missing. So mapping supports equitable representation and diversification of stakeholders. And maps can also show us who we think we should, who we think we know should be involved, but they can also point out who might have been excluded. Um, they serve as a tool for transparency. Um, so um, have you ever kind of like had a moment where you've been invited to something, but like a party, but you're not sure if you want to go because you're not sure who else is going to be at this party. So, well, in a way, like stakeholder maps can kind of serve as a metaphoric guest list. So transparency really helps us build trusting relationships um, and keeps us open and honest. And it can, and when people can see something like that, they might want to be like, I want to be at the table too. You know, all these other folks are here. My voice is really important as well. And I want to be part of all of this work. Um, and, you know, it enables us to really start considering the larger systems um, and, de and dependencies that may influence the project. So in other words, it really allows us to start understanding how like money, power, politics, histories, technologies and technology infrastructures, environments, all of that can really influence the project. Um, and then, oh, I wrote a last one here. It helps build trust and ownership with the end user and community. So when they, when they can see who's part of it, um, they they can tell you know who is building this with them. They can and if they see themselves on these um, maps too and are invited to the table, um, that even better, right? Um, and I just want to also just kind of take a moment to really kind of say that the, you know that partnerships and relationships are really strengthened through ongoing and meaningful engagement. So investing in these relationships respectfully and with honesty is crucial to building successful and sustainable programs, services, and products for our communities. So stakeholder mapping and analysis really sets us up for this kind of success. So where, when should we do it? Okay, all right. I'm bringing back Skylight's framework here that Liz and Victor shared with us earlier um, that emphasizes like the initiate phase, the first phase. Yep, you know that slide, Liz. <laughs> um, and so this is the initiate phase here where I'm highlighting, this is when we should take the time to align on key stakeholder objectives and map our stakeholders. It's always advised to stakeholder do stakeholder mapping and analysis as early on as possible in your project. I know someone had a question about that earlier. Um, this could either be during scoping, once you've secured a contract and initiated a kickoff with any partners, or it could even happen before committing to a client. So, um, and so you can help like assess the breadth of the people who you'll need to be involving and managing. Um, and you can also do stakeholder mapping when your team is entering a new market and wanting to expand new business offerings too. So it's like prep stuff, right? Um, and one thing I'd really like to recommend is that teams revisit your maps um, throughout the duration of your project. So relationships, you know, they can change, right? And sometimes our projects go for more than a few months. They can go for years. They can be on pause and delay and like there will be turnover, all of this kind of stuff. So you really want to just be sure that you are like recalling this a lot um, and talking to different people. Um, you know, new stakeholders could likely emerge the more you talk to folks when you're doing research work and, you know, and then um, your project may also evolve and just in, in general call, ask for you to re reassess who your stakeholders are. All right. 
So who should participate in creating the stakeholder map? Who's going to make it, right? And not, not just, obviously, we need some people who are like makers that are going to do the physical building of the project, but also who are going to contribute their brains for like, who is going to be on this map, right? <laughs> My answer is, I'm just kidding. It's not everyone. We can't have all the cooks in the kitchen here, right? Really, the answer is, it kind of depends. So it depends on things like <laughs> your project's goals, the values you're trying to instill through the project, um, your team's capacity, attitudes, and the amount of time you have allotted for your project. Um, so how to kind of think about this is some, maybe putting, I just put up some good questions here to think about when you're deciding who should participate in the creation of the map. So things like, what are your project's values? Um, how involved or uninvolved do you want your stakeholders to be in the research, design and development, implementation of the project, and really ask yourself why you want them involved or not involved? Um, do you and your team believe participation is an ingredient for success? Yes, I hope so. Um, and are you willing and ready to take on the responsibilities of managing multi-stakeholder relationships and where needed providing different levels of care for folks, especially those who would benefit from compensation or other types of support? Um, so it's really important to consider how much can you hold the communities that you're being um, in, you know, involving and partnering with. Um, and also just really thinking about like, do you have a diverse range of mindsets and perspectives and identities and experiences in the room? And if you look around and you're like, nope, this is like kind of homogenous or whatever, um, you know, you might want to like start to invite other folks to give their perspective. Um, so some people who commonly participate in these types of maps are project leads, obviously. So directors, managers, project partners. Um, the researchers for sure, uh, design and implementation team members, subject matter experts, um, relevant leadership, um, you know, and then also, of course, like participants. So those who administer and also who receive the intervention or, or the service to try to uh, create. So while I'm naming off mostly role types, um, you don't always have to decide who's in the room based on their role, right? You can also think about inviting people who have diverse and critical mindsets or ways of thinking about relationships that could add value at this stage. Um, so stakeholder mapping can also be like a great moment. Um, I just wanna add too for like professional development. So inviting more newer team members or junior team members or just members or partners who tend to operate in silos to observe and participate in these sessions is a great way for them to understand the complexities of the project and for and um, who the project may be dependent on. So when people see they're part of a larger movement or endeavor, they oftentimes they'll be more bought in and engaged in helping steer the project to its success. Um, and Gori, Godoy, Godoy, maybe it will be covered later, but how to manage sea level that wants to be on the on the loop and participate, but hardly has availability to engage and stuck the project or yes, yes, yes. All right, let's pause and like talk about that real quick. Um, totally get you there because uh, I think most of us have had this challenge before of like, how do we get these sea level folks in the room to like really see what's going on in this project um, and give us give us the, the space, you know, um, and the permission to do our work since they're like really hovering above us. Um, you know, one thing is like stakeholder, stakeholder mapping can be done in like, or, or you can invite them to some sessions where they are, you're at, you know, one way you can do is just like really trying to set up those sessions in a way where you can reach out to them and like position it in a way um, and asking, you know, for their expertise um, to show up. They, they can, you can also ask them in a way where it's like a little Trojan horsey where you can say, I, I would love for you to come represent and talk about X, Y, Z initiative that you're doing and then segue into like a brainstorm session around sharing different stakeholders. So they're there as like, to just be frank, like ego stroke, right have them share what they're doing and celebrate that but they're already there so you've got them in and then you can try to do that another way is just like really making sure you're tied closely to some of their deputy folks you know and that they're involved in these maps and advocating for them to try to get their leadership 
to the table. We've in, in government, we've designed sessions that are like 30 minutes to just like get folks in and out. And, and even that can be enough. Um, but a lot of times, if it's not at the stakeholder mapping moment, there are plenty of opportunities along the service design phase where you can invite them during research, during brainstorming and implementation or like prototyping, um, you know, all, all that kind of stuff too um, can happen. But we can, we can talk about that a little bit more later on. Okay, <laughs> ego management, yes. <laughs> um, so who should be in, included in the stakeholder map, right? All right, what do you think my answer is gonna be? Anybody? <laughs> Everybody. <laughs> I'm just kidding again, but though, though we should aim to be exhaustive and inclusive as we can. Um, yeah, again, Liz, yes, you're right, it depends. Um, so I'll kind of get into some ways to help us organize our thinking around this. Yep, good job, Liz. I wish I could like throw you some swag or something, um, but for now, I'm gonna give you a thumbs up. Um, so I love sharing skylights images, but Victor and Liz shared this illustration during their talk, right? So as you can tell, I like, um, and and you can see all this all this stuff in their toolkit too. So to help us develop a thoughtful list of stakeholders, we can start to think in terms of say like a theater performance like you have here in this image where you have an audience, front stage, backstage and behind the scenes people. So the backstage um, or behind the scenes people are those who support the delivery of the service and they're often not visible to the folks in the front stage or in the audience, right? So examples of backstage stakeholders could be ops, admin folks, data scientists, engineers, IT, legal, comms teams even, um, the funders maybe, policy makers and other subject matter experts. And there could be a ton more, but these are just some examples. And then the front stage or the audience members are those who will receive, use or deliver the service. So examples of front stage stakeholders could include the program administrators or frontline staff that are delivering these things. Like here in New York City, we contract with community-based organizations all across the city to deliver our services here. So it's really important for us to be including those community-based organizations and their program provide and those program providers to really understand how those services are administered um, and how they're received. Um, facility staff for like on location based type of services. And obviously our customers um, call them clients or community members as well. Um, and their support network sometimes, it, it depends on the project, but you do wanna also really consider family, friends, social service organizations, community navigators, um, you know, people, people don't operate in one straight line all day. They've, we've got complex lives going on, right? And we have multiple, we have, you know, diverse relationships and, um, you know, these like, uh, so we have to think more pluralistic, pluralistically in that way um, and, and be open to thinking beyond just the individual that is affected. Um, and also obviously the broader public audience is, is watching a lot of this um, and, and can be scrutinizing a lot of this work. Um, so yeah, so you may wanna take this framework and sit with your team to brainstorm the types of stakeholders for your project who fit within these like four buckets. So you could do that as simply as like, just putting, you know, audience, uh, front stage, backstage, behind the scenes, like on a board and just brainstorming or taking post-its and saying, oh, these are front stage people, these are backstage people. And then that's how you can start. And that gives you a little bit more structure. Um, one other way too, is just really thinking about these kind of buckets of being inclusive, exhaustive and specific. Um, so the front stage and backstage framework can help us really consider inclusivity though. I'll say you should definitely have people in the room who are versed and critically thinking about inclusion um, and then zooming out and thinking about end-to-end -end processes and a larger system at play can also help us widen our view um, and also being specific and identifying people down to their name, their role, their level of influence, their lived experience is also really helpful. So this is another kind of simplified way to kind of think about all of this. And I just wanna also kind of pause here for a moment to shine light on this question here. We really have to remind ourselves to ask who is not at the table. So, you know, you may have finished a brainstorm session, 
that you want to pause and, and ask this question at least one time, you know, because um, there's always bound to be somebody to add. Um, we can't forget that the services we build um, shouldn't be just for the norm or the majority of our customers or communities, but also for people who have been historically excluded from our considerations, such as like immigrant communities, people with disabilities, queer and trans communities, and others who have been disempowered by our systems for way far too long. Um, so I want to show you a couple ways to map, like simple ways to map, but I'm also seeing that we're kind of at a 45 minute mark here. Cheryl, do you feel like, um, and folks, do we feel like we want to take a little quick break here? I want to be mindful of, of people's time. <laughs> All right. So cool, cool. So there are um, there's a lot of ways to map our stakeholders, um, and, and there's really no one white, right way. Um, so in this section, I'm just going to show you these simple sort of high level diagrams that kind of depict simple and common ways to think about mapping. But, you know, if you Google stakeholder mapping, um, you know, you'll see all kinds of sketches, some that are beautiful and easy some that you just want to shut your computer off because they're just so ridiculously complex that you're like, this is not helping. <laughs> so they run the gamut. Um, and that's why designers are also really, um, and especially information type designers are really important uh, to be part of these things because they're really great at visually simplifying stuff and making stuff digestible too. Um, so there's that, but here we go. A couple of examples. Um, so the first one, super simple, just a list table. You know, it's a relatively simple, no fuss way to analyze your stakeholders. So you can do things, yep, love a good list, Liz. Um, you can do things like color code who has more or less influence on the success of your project. You can do other kind of, um, you know, other metadata too, but um, this, this kind of can give you like a really great example of how to do it simply and not having to have like a designy thing be part of it. Um, the great thing about this one too, is it also kind of doubles as a Rolodex slash project management list right off the bat. So your project manager can take this and run with it and start inviting folks, moving names around, all that kind of stuff. So you, you get the whole uh, full on profile um, of all the folks that are, are involved in your work. You can also plot your stakeholders on an XY kind of access plane here. So mapping things like level of interest um, from you know, lowest to highest interest to level of influence um, around the project. Um, and then uh, you can also plot your stakeholders kind of based on who you need to manage closely or less closely. So here you've got um, the level, the stakeholders level of power and their interest in the project. Um, and it helps you understand like, who do I need to like maintain their confidence, keep them in the know, keep them satisfied versus, you know, who might I need to collaborate with and just like make sure I'm managing closely. Those might be like the, the ones you spend the most time with. Um, who might I just sort of like, who, who needs to just like be monitored and watched over? And then who do I kind of like lightly need to keep informed? Is that like a, the general public, like all of that kind of stuff. So you can kind of grid it out in this way if you want to. Um, and I think another way to frame that could be based on things based on like the, the stakeholders level of awareness of the project or the issue area. Um, and the level of support they might have, whether they support the project or the issue area or, or if they don't. Um, and then you can move away from squares, you know, and grids and also, you know, take on this kind of bullseye structure to plot things on a, a pro, you know, bullseye proximity and maybe put your core stakeholder in the middle and then map out from there the proximity of influence to that core stakeholder um, that you're trying to work with. Um, so kind of, but moving like away from like power, influence, interest types of frameworks, um, you can also cluster things based on the type of stakeholders. So in this matrix, and this is, this is very related to the um, front stage backstage diagram that I showed all of you earlier. 
um, you can base things on like who receives or uses your service. So, um, and, and map those folks um, who delivers it. So who engages with your users to help better deliver the service, um, who designs your service. So who's responsible for the design and policy, policy decisions when developing or improving the service. And also just kind of like who else is impacted by it? Who else might your work touch on now or in the future? Um, I, I like this one to start off with and would recommend this kind of framework before you consider using a lot of the other ones I've shown. Um, because a lot of the other frameworks I just want to point out, and there's an article that will be in the resource stuff that goes into this more deeply. Um, but the other ones, if you haven't noticed, they're really based a lot on power and influence. And everyone defines power and influence differently. Um, so we really need to, uh, you know, we could talk about that all day um, in a separate session. <laughs> Um, we can talk about it more if we have time later to the end of the day too. Um, but if you are interested in learning more about power and how that plays a role um, in your decision making, uh, you can check out this really great article um, about power literacy frameworks that was actually introduced to me by Abigail, um, who was there earlier on in the um, in the panel discussion when we worked together at the service design studio. So I'm just going to put um, this Maya Goodwill article here about power literacy in the chat um, if you want to take a look at that later on. Um, and lastly, and most importantly, the FOMO scale. <laughs> They're the fear of missing out scale. Um, this is just a joke that I made up when I and I just wanted to throw it in here for fun. So, you know, you don't have to take this seriously at all. Um, but if you do use this, because it kind of could be useful, let me know. I want to know. Um, I'm also really sorry. I just had to put in an animated GIF of the former New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio, who was my first boss in like, the first administration that I worked in under New York City. I just kind of couldn't help myself with this. <laughs> yeah, sure, I do. That's why I put it in. I was like, you know, FOMO's for real. Um, so, but maybe the point um, here is that you can also kind of consider who really, um, oops, let me go back, who really wants to be in your project versus who doesn't, you know, but it, you can also really think about maybe, you know, it's not about which stakeholders fear they're going to miss out on participating in the project. It could also be about who your team really wishes was included for fear that if they're not, that the final intervention may not be as successful or sustainable, right? So that those are two different things to think about. <laughs> I'm just laughing in the chat. Um, so just some examples of like real world kind of sketches that I've pulled from like the internet and other kind of places. So um, what a map looks like can really, really vary. So again, there's no one right, right way. Um, the important thing is that people can understand it. Um, I'll flip through some of these examples um, and to give you an idea of some of the like kind of different ways we're doing it. So here you've got like a hand hand drawn, you know, clusterings of post its um, and a whiteboard sketch that also clusters stakeholders into categories. So these are like, you know, drafty, dirty kind of things you can do. Just take a pen, circle, you know, the different folks um, that you're mapping out. There's also this kind of like bullseye diagram with this XY influence thing overlay over that one. So you could do something like this. Um, there's also like mind map styles that include specific names here. So again, being specific can really, really help. And, and this one gets really deep because it starts to draw lines around who's connected to who. And then, you know, you've got like flow charts like this. So this is something that you can do in like, uh, you, you know, uh, Microsoft uh, Office or, in, you know, in Google Slides or something like that too. So a flow chart could also work out really well. Um, or this really complex radial diagram where the darker portions visualize all government stakeholders under one agency. So that's uh, Administration for Children's Services here in New York City. Um, and and they're a pretty huge um, uh, administration in and of themselves. So there was a lot of mapping to do just around them. So, you know, a designer took this and created this type of interpretation of the stakeholders. Um, there's there's more diagrams um, that I can share uh, later on, and there's more ways to to map stakeholders, um, and there'll be some more uh, that will that I can point you to in the in the resource doc too. Okay, so let us 
bring back our papers and sketches and all those types of things now. Um, we're about to go into some more music. <laughs> Seems like some folks are enjoying that, so I'm going to give you some more music shortly. Um, so my lecture portion part, for the most part, is over. I hope that was like super helpful in getting folks started. Um, but you know, again, please put some questions and all that kind of stuff in so we can have a chat. Um, so what I want you to do now is to really kind of revisit your initial warm-up documents. Um, take some time now to add and edit your stakeholders. And if you feel you have the energy and want to kind of move into starting to, you know, map this stuff out based on some of the examples I provided, you can do that as well. Um, so you can start to, um, you can also go back to these, the templates um, that I shared. I'll drop in the link again here. Um, and in the templates, you'll see not these ones, but uh, there's two mapping templates. Sorry, this is tiny for folks, but there's the receive, deliver, design, impacted one, as well as an influence interest matrix. So if you want to use that, um, you can use those. Those may be good starter ones to try out. Um, so let's take that time. Um, and um, while I'm doing this, I, I'll go ahead and just show you um, examples of like how I interpreted the, the DMV one. So just to if someone needs some context here. So again, you know, this was what I had shown earlier of like, who did I think about really quickly when I was just kind of jotting folks down, right. Um, but if I took this and put this on like that influence, um, that influence interest map, uh, so let's look at that. Um, I was able, one, to add more stakeholders um, and plot them on an XY kind of influence access line here. Um, and by doing this, it's helped me kind of better understand who I need to pay attention to and how many stakeholders I have to consider. But like be between the first session and this, this is like magic of television kind of thing. You know, I added more stakeholders like um, CIOs, CTOs, policy advisors. I put things like the Ohio State DMV here because they're considered like one of the best D states, you know, for the DMV, oops, sorry about that. Um, so maybe we wanna call them up and say, how are you guys doing it, you know? Um, and then, you know, a couple other folks um, I added to this map and then I started placing them in, and I just made this kind of thing up, but this might be a helpful guidance. Um, I am going to then move over to music time now and give you again another 10 minutes or so. We'll, we'll, we'll play it by ear based on where the songs kind of end up here. So you can go heads down and start like sketch, sketching and all that kind of stuff. Um, and if you have questions in the meantime, feel free to drop them in the chat. Um, so yeah, and then after all of this, uh, we'll go into Q&A reflections and just I'll share that resource doc and all of stuff and then we'll just wrap up, all right? All right, everybody, let's bring it together. Um, I'd love to invite anyone to sort of drop in any impressions or observations about how your exercises, you know, evolved or transformed today. Um, so, or just any general impressions of today's workshop. Um, feel free to drop them in the chat. So I put some um, prompts up here to help you. So if, if you have any impressions or ob ob eh, observations about the exercise, um, or if you have a takeaway today, um, anything that you learned that was new um, and inspiring, would love to hear. Um, so yeah, um, Cheryl, I'll kind of, if you want to help also, if there's any questions popping up in the chat, help, help, happy to do that. Or if you want to start getting people to jump off mute. Um, we can do that. Yeah, I think we have we have time left. So uh, we've got about 15 minutes to do questions or discussion. So if anybody has something that they would like to share, um, you're welcome to let's let's manage by using the raise hand feature here in Zoom. And then um, if you have something that you want to chat about, if you don't, I do. Because I was working on my stakeholder map. It's it's, yeah. it's pretty sketchy right now, but I've got this I've got this thing. So um, I work with high school students, and we uh, mentor low income students that are trying to that are high achieving academically and trying to apply to college. 
And one of the things that we would like to have happen is um, we would like for them to apply to an early college access program that requires them to do a fair amount of work over the summer when we don't see them. So I need to convince a bunch of 16 and 17 year olds to spend their summer doing, uh, you know, writing essays and filling out forms that they don't wanna fill out. And so I'm trying to figure out who are the stakeholders that I can involve in that work. Because we've got some experiment, of course we've leaped ahead and we have some experiments that we wanna try. But in thinking about the program, I'm thinking about how their families are impacted by their need to do stuff over the summer, or they may have a summer job. And so their employers have a say in how these students spend their time. Um, mm -hmm. And our mentors, in fact, also volunteered during the school year and didn't didn't sign up to do mentoring in the summer, though most of them are happy to do it. So it it really did get me thinking about who all is affected by this this program change that we want to implement. And rather than just foisting solutions upon them, uh, probably talking to more of them and getting them on board with or, you know, hearing out what their questions and concerns are. Mm -hmm. You can hear me go into that action of, I want to try to get them to do something. But right. the whole point of this exercise, I think, is really to remind us that we need to listen to them first and include, and it may come to pass that through all of that listening and interviewing, we may find that that summer application program isn't the right solution for these students. Mm -hmm. um, and so I have to remind myself to be open to that as a possible outcome as well. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I love that you really consider like their lived experience, what's happening in the summer, you know, that they're interacting with different folks in the summertime, their motivations are changing. Those types of questions help to uplift um, folks that you may not have thought about earlier. Mm -hmm. um, and I really also love that you have opened up to the possibility that this might not work, you know. Right. Um, and that's okay, right? So we don't want to keep pushing ourselves to design interventions that mm -hmm. and force force feed interventions that aren't going to be sustainable. So this is this is a really great reflection. Thanks, Thank thanks, you, Cheryl. Yeah. yeah. Anybody else um, thoughts about the stakeholder mapping work or just general question? You've been doing a good job of monitoring the chat, Mari. So yeah. let me know if you want me to, but I'm happy yeah. to. Okay. As it gets busier, perhaps I will, uh, I'll help you yeah. manage some of the flow. Started, so Christina, I started with the stakeholder types matrix, um, which was super helpful. And then from there, it made sense to plot the design, the service box onto the power matrix. Great, mm -hmm. great, great. Yep. So that I hope that was like kind of a smooth transition from like a jot down brainstorm to starting to plot. Um, great, great. And then Anna, interested in hearing any experiences you may have with changes in the project and adding new stakeholders along the way and how that changed the project and how you handled it. Whew. So a lot of times, um, you know, we'll map a bunch of stakeholders in the beginning. And I, I feel like, you know, I've been on teams who are pretty good about being pretty exhaustive about it. But what happens after you do these mappings is that you know, you're not going to go straight into designing the solution, right? You, you, what what happens after that, um, you know, and you'll see that in the uh, skylight, you know, phase uh, service design phases is that we, you know, we then go heads down to really conduct research and start talking to the people who are, um, you know, delivering and using these types of services. Um, during those research um, engagements, oftentimes, we start to find out who else those people are affected by and influenced by. Some will name drop specific people um, that we hadn't thought about or didn't have a uh, connection to. So we start to add those types of folks um, to the map. So research is a great time to start to bring and service more people um, that we were unaware of. And then you start to plot those folks on the map too. Um, and then from there, you know, then you can start to really reach out and engage with them more. Um, but you get that fuller breath coming from the community or through your research to help inform that. Um, how that's changed a project? Well, I'd say that like one, two, in two instances, like one, it's like, you know, if you have a flexible team um, and if you've already baked in a timeline to do research and to like do all of this stuff, you know, it may, it, 
it may come with limitations because you might only have like a, a couple weeks to do the research sprint and then you have to move on. It could kind of depends. Um, but if you, uh, what I like to try to do in the beginning of an engagement is to sit with our, our, our partners, um, you know, and then sit there and say like, you know, we, we really got to be mindful of baking in some flexibility through this type of process. So what happens is um, before we engage and start to start the project and during kickoff, um, we'll talk about like, what are the values um, of this project, you know, and um, what might happen? What don't, what might we encounter, you know, and because of our experience, we can, we can predict that these may, these, these things may happen. Um, and so as principal, um, as part of our principles for designing, um, we might agree with that partner to say, you know, if more folks emerge or if we need to do research, um, you know, we can agree on like expanding our research time or something like that. Um, and kind of getting that commitment and then putting it on paper in the beginning to hold everyone accountable. So if that time does come, we are continuing to make space. Now that is, you know, not always um, the reality for a lot of service designers. I mean, they don't have that kind of leverage to, to create more space and all that kind of stuff, but it's just really important to think ahead and plan for that and get folks to hold themselves accountable. So that's definitely one way. Um, and I, <laughs> I also got to points where I would just really be firm with our partners who are pushing back and telling them like, if we don't include these additional folks who have surfaced, it may jeopardize the success of this project. And um, it's worth adding a week, you know, in the bigger picture, because a lot of the work that we're doing, as you saw through the case studies is saving hundreds and thousands of people's lives at the end of the day. Um, so another week of research, um, I think is definitely <laughs> worth it, right? Um, so that that might be my response for now uh, to that question, Anna. I hope that was helpful. Um, Hanan, um, and also I apologize to everybody if I'm pronouncing your name wrong, feel, feel free to go off mute and correct me if I'm um, wrong. Um, but let's see, going up to Hanan, question perhaps, or do you want to go off mute? Oh, yeah. Hi, this is Liz. Hey, sorry. Oh, hey, you said earlier that you were cool if the other presenters jumped in at the Q&A part. Is it yes, cool? Yes, yes, yes. Oh, yeah, totally forgot. Thanks, Liz. Jump no, no, I just, I want to make sure that's so cool. But um, I have a nightmare related to this question that I can share if you'd like. <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. When Anna posted that question in the chat, I think I saw my entire life flash before my eyes. The last um, really complex service design project I worked on with the Air Force um, had the exact thing that you describe happen. About halfway through the project, we'd been really clear with our stakeholders and communicating about we're in the discovery phase and here's what we're finding and does the service blueprint look right and all this and it was going really well. And then out of nowhere, I got an email um, from one of our very high up leadership stakeholders saying, hey, so we're going to have to pivot the project. And now you're doing a different version of this project that combines work streams from like this other group you'd never heard of before. Um, and instead of being just for a tool to request accommodations for a disability, it's now going to have to be a tool to um, accommodate or to do accommodation requests for literally every type of accommodation that you could have. Um, what I should have done at that point was call the project to a screeching halt and do another one of these rounds of like, kind of re-kick off the project and stakeholder management and all this, um, like actually map out our new people and figure out like who needed to be involved and who didn't. Um, and I didn't do that. I just got caught up in being sort of eager to please and, and thinking, oh boy, this is an even bigger scope of problems that I could help solve. That's great. Uh, and it was just an absolute communication chaos shit show for a couple of weeks while we tried to figure out what was going on and who was doing what and who was making decisions. So the minute you start to suspect that things are going off the rails because you've got some um, stakeholder chaos, I highly recommend pausing and doing this exercise again. Thanks so much, Liz. I am also sorry that you had to go through that trauma. And I think a lot of uh, folks can relate, Liz. Um, sometimes uh, one way to think about this too, right? Cause the, the moment has passed, right? And it's, it's happened. 
And it's, it's you know, but uh, one thing that um, I've done and that I've done with teams um, is doing project debriefs. Um, so when the project ends or when you have a moment for debrief, say you go through a phase, one of the design phases and you do a debrief with everyone, that's, that's a moment where you can talk about this, you know, um, and, and maybe facilitate a conversation about what's working so far, what's not working, what can we do better, right? And then if you do have accountability measures or principles that you have designed together um, with folks, um, you can revisit those um, again to just uphold them and say, are we upholding these, you know? Um, so these are ways to kind of, it, you know, at least highlight that and say, hopefully we don't do this again. Right, um, and and we're learning from this um, as we go forward. So that's that's something that you can um, try to bake in after. Awesome. Um, any other questions, reflections? Oh yeah, I do. I saw. Oh, let me go back. There's two more in here. Uh, Hanan had a question about. Um, question perhaps depends on the purpose of the map, but how can we avoid the stakeholder map from being a dead document? Yes, uh, right. Um, I This happens very often. We make these like really beautiful visual assets and put a lot of time into it. We show it and then put it away and no one ever sees it again. Um, I think uh, a couple of things is um, one, you know, help, one, if you if you do have a public presence with the project um, and you want to be transparent, you can leverage it as a communication asset, you know, to talk about who was involved. So you celebrate it that way. Um, you can even, if you want to, on the side, just kind of talk about how you did that mapping too, and write like a separate blog piece about it to really show its importance. Um, I've also been in rooms where we printed that stakeholder map. Um, you know, at the end of a project to really kind of show that, uh, showcase it again um, and explain all the folks that had been involved in developing the work and who, you know, what. And, and so sometimes in um, wrap ups or any kind of celebrations, we will show that again. Um, and we bring it up a lot externally too. Like if you are talking about the issue and presenting it at a conference. So these are other places it can show up. Um, but also again, like internally too, if, um, one thing that we had mentioned earlier about like, do you put out like regular newsletters for C-suite level, C level folks and stuff like that. These types of things can show up again in those types of messages, you know, and communications to really hit home why that thing was so important. Um, so those are some tips on ways you can keep that thing alive. Um, yeah, so I hope that's helpful, Hannah. And then Sharang underneath asked, can we, you know, can stakeholders be taken into consideration in speculative scenarios, um, in a speculative scenario? Um, I think, again, it depends, right? Um, but I do think that like, it's always worth including people um, that you're not sure might influence the project for awareness building. Um, and it, and in the future, they may become relevant, right? So like, let's give a really high level example of like, these days we're talking a lot about um, climate change and, you know, really trying to support our planet, <laughs> you know, repair our planet essentially. And as we think about that, we're moving beyond human centered design and we're starting to talk about like, the, the ecosystems that we're part of. So plants and animals and things like that are coming into play now. And those people, and those, not people, sorry, those creatures and beings have voices as well. And so, you know, that may be, that might've been super speculative another day, but we're starting to realize that like those, those types of things are really mattering, right? Um, more and more these days. And so it's it's not speculative anymore. I mean, I just finished reading some Octavia Butler, Parable of the Sower, and they wrote that book, you know, in the, you know, uh, and saying that like in 2025 or whatever, the world's gonna look like this story, but I'm reading it today and I'm like, a lot of the stuff happening in this book is happening now. So having a speculative approach to things can be really helpful. Just making it really clear that those speculative stakeholders may not exist now, but leaving that in, at, you know, in the minds as a bookmark 
can be really helpful for like really expanding uh, people's mindset. I hope that was a helpful answer. I don't know if other folks want to jump in from panelists and stuff today to, to answer to that, but it looks like you got some good feedback also from William. Um, folks also feel free. Oh yeah. Uh, William. Yeah. <laughs> go off. Go off. Oh, well, thank you. I was just going to add, so I, I'm in the city of Vancouver, Washington, and um, we were working on our, when we were designing our climate action framework, um, a big focus of our work was looking at the range of scenarios that were likely, the range of scenarios that were possible, um, and then sort of cross-referencing stakeholders that appeared across all of those, right? So no matter what the outcome, which are going to be most central, which are going to be most key at kind of reaching people, um, either serving that communication function or that service delivery function. Um, and so that was a great way to kind of prioritize those relationships and think also about areas where we need to strengthen them, maybe in the coming months and years. Thanks, William. All right, I think we are at time, Cheryl. I don't know, you wanna wrap up or take one more question? Last we have another thought, question, anyone? happy to do another question. Otherwise we can move into our wrap up for the day. Cool, um, so I think we are done. Um, mm -hmm. I, again, I dropped in the resources um, uh, link earlier on I'll do it one more time here but there's a bunch of resources in this doc that you're happy to like welcome to to poke through um, a lot of them uh, I think some of you already know about um, and I just wanted to just wrap up with just like a, a huge thank you um, one thing I just want to apologize for uh, but to also in, in this wrap up too is to just recognize that you know I am coming from the Lenape Hoking territory here in, in Brook, otherwise known as Brooklyn. So I just do wanna make that acknowledgement and show my thanks uh, for um, you know, indigenous communities. Um, and I also wanna just you know, tell y'all like, I just had a wonderful time being in community with you today. Really good vibes, super great energy, amazing people um, on, on these talks. Um, and I really wanted to thank the team at Skylight for inviting me to the table um, and to this community today and also just give a big shout out to Cheryl, who has been an incredible organizer and leader in this space. Um, so with that, just, you know, sending lots of joy and thanks uh, out there into the world. So thanks so much, Cheryl, um, and I will stop sharing so you can wrap up the, the day. <laughs>